Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's just great to, to, to see you all here. Uh, and Annette, you had to mention that Conan O'Brien thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, we're, we're thrilled to have you back. And uh, in the time that we have uh, together, I just I want to share with you uh, how I think, um, how I'm thinking now about how to take this great institution uh, into the next era. You know, we're going to celebrate our 250th anniversary in eight short years. <clears throat> and so as you look back and look forward, um, it's extremely important to figure out what is the stuff of this place? What, what is at its core? Why is it that alums are so passionate about this place? Why are students and faculty and staff so passionate about this place? Well, um, here you are. Is it Elaine Birch? Is she here today, 86? Kim Hoagland, uh, Bev Bruni, and David Sanders was the trip leader, and on the right, is one of our great new trustees, Bill Burgess from the class of 1981. Where's Bill? <laughs> and you know, Bill, you look 14, but the woman next to you looks like she's about 12, right? <laughs> and you know, this is part of the spirit of this place. We have every fall. Um, uh, 1,100 of the most brilliant, enthusiastic, wonderful young people coming in, and, and our participation rate on the DOC trips is now close to 97 percent. So, uh, so they truly share this great initial experience. And here's a group from the class of 1976 uh, taking off <clears throat> on their trips. You know, in trying to understand the uh, the, the, the great brilliant strength of this institution, I've been spending a lot of time going back and reading. Um, I've gone back as far as uh, reading the works of uh, William Jewett Tucker uh, back in the late 1800s. But in 2004, Booz Allen Hamilton designated two educational institutions to be among what they called enduring institutions. And, and uh, uh, Dartmouth was one, and in a um, in a, in, a, uh, in a gesture for diversity, I, I don't know how this other institution was named, Oxford was also named. Uh, uh, but they talked about legitimacy, uh, risk structure, adaptive response, culture and values, information flow, governance and leadership, but the most important aspect of a great enduring institution was innovation. So uh, in building on this future, and building into the future on the, on the strength of the past, I look to rituals like this. Now, what they're passing, this is Ernest Martin Hopkins on the left, John Sloan Dickey on the right. This was November of 1945. <clears throat> Some of you may have heard that John Sloan Dickey became, was announced as the next president of the United, of the, uh, not the United States. <laughs> he, he got a much better job than that. Than that. <laughs> In August of 1945, it was announced that John Sloan Dickey would be the next president of Dartmouth College. In that same month, as the head of public affairs at the State Department, John Sloan Dickey had to stand up to the world and defend the dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's the sense of urgency that John Sloan Dickey brought to the campus. That's the sense of urgency that he brought to all of the students when he told them about what he expected of them as, they, uh, as Dartmouth College students. Uh, they handed, they're handing off here something called the Wentworth Bowl, given by Lord Wentworth in 1771 to Eliezer Wheelock. And the legend is that only presidents of Dartmouth College have ever touched this bowl with their bare hands. Right? And so uh, as we were getting ready for um, my inauguration, uh, I, I talked to Jim Wright, and uh, we were looking forward to this. But then the people from Rauner Library who are in charge of, uh, uh, of maintaining this bowl, when they showed it to me, 
Uh, they were all wearing gloves. Now, you know, you just know that they take their gloves off and touch it every once in a while. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but they, they told me that this is the second most precious piece of silver in the United States, and they think that Jim Wright and I should wear gloves when we hand it to each other. Right? So then, of course, uh, I asked right away, all right, so what's the most precious piece of silver in the United States? And they didn't know, right? Uh, so, so I... Stanley Cup, <laughs> yeah! That's right. The Stanley, Stanley Cup. Uh, uh, so, so... Uh, I, I talked to Jim Wright, and those of you from the uh, more recent classes uh, know Jim Wright's voice very, very well. Students used to call it the voice of God, right? <laughs> it's really hard to take over for the voice of God. Uh, and so I talked to Jim, and I said, Jim, you know, there's all this stuff, they want us to wear gloves, and he said to me in that beautiful, deep baritone, Jim, we're gonna touch the damn ball. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what, you know, we have traditions going back 240 years. The, the students love the fact that they do the same things that they, that they, that now that you guys did, you know, 25, 35, 100 years ago. How do you build on that to create the greatest institution of higher education in the world? Well, all of you know the magic of Dartmouth happens in the classroom. This is where the real magic happens. And it's very different here uh, at Dartmouth in the sense that all of our professors have to both teach and do research, right? Now, if you go to the, any of the other Ivy League institutions, even though they may tell you differently, if you are a superstar researcher, it is uh, very frequent that you are told something like this. You've done so well in research, you've got all these research grants, you're publishing like crazy, we will reward you by never forcing you to see a student in the time that you're here. <laughs> so, so this happens, not everybody, lots of people still are teaching undergraduates, but that happens in a lot of places uh, in, in the Ivy League, especially in the sciences. But here at Dartmouth, we have a process that's, that's fundamentally different. Every um, um, winter and spring, I sit with the committee advisory to the president, and we go over tenure decisions. And not only do we look at their research, they have to be great researchers because one of the things that we know is that you do not want people who are not at the forefront of their fields teaching your students. You just don't want that. There are other places that say we're a great teaching institution and their professors may read all the most recent papers, read the journals and go to the meetings, but it's different from being a player in the world that you're teaching about. So we'll never back off from the commitment to having our teachers, uh, our, our professors be great researchers. But at the same time, we do something that's very different. I've never done this before in looking at tenure decisions. We write to all of the students, or, or a large cross-section of the students, during the last five years prior to their tenure uh, decision. And we get these, and many of you have, may have written them, we get these back, and we sit there and we look at them very carefully and we've done both things. We have denied tenure to people who are great researchers and bad teachers, and we have also denied tenure to people who are great teachers, but not up to speed in, in terms of research. It's a very difficult standard. As, in, in my experience, we, you know, we're, we're one of very few, of any, who really try to do this at the level that we try to do it, and that's where the magic happens. The, the scholar-teacher model is one that, that we have been on the forefront of and will continue to do that. This is the great John Kemeny. <laughs> I'm, one, I'm wondering if Jean is in the audience. Is she here? Jenny, Jenny excuse me. Jean's, Jenny's not here. OK. Well, so then I can say whatever I want. <laughs> but isn't this a great picture, right? Just the nerdiest picture of all time. Uh, <laughs> I want to pose like that, but we just don't have any more overhead projectors anywhere. Uh, uh, uh. President Kemeny, as you know, was a phenomenal innovator. 
And President Kemeny also um, uh, talked a lot about how he was able to make great innovations in computer science while not having a graduate program. We actually do have a graduate program in computer science now. But when he invented the time-sharing system, how many of you remember that time when the time-sharing system? It was one of four in the country. Uh, if you read a book uh, called Outliers, it talks about how um, uh, uh, Bill Sun Microsystems, I forgot his last name, Bill Joy, is it? Yeah, of Sun Microsystems happened to be lucky enough to go to Michigan, which is one, which is one of four places in the country that had a time-sharing system, and Dartmouth was one of them. Right? So he did this, but I think in the way he did it, in the way that he wrote this science article, he was sending a message to every future president of Dartmouth College. He wasn't president at this time, but read it. Dartmouth time-sharing, development of, a, of the system by a team of faculty and undergraduates is described. President Kemeny used to say that the reason we beat MIT in building a time-sharing system is that we had the great advantage of only having undergraduates and not graduate students. Graduate students wanted to make everything more complicated and cool. Undergraduates just wanted it to work. <laughs> the message here is clear. Understand who you are. Understand what you've got. And then innovate like crazy on that foundation. So what does that mean for us? If this is, if this is a mission statement, if this is a vision for how you do innovation at Dartmouth, what does it mean for us? Well, <clears throat> this is a meeting from 1966. This is the Anglo-American Seminar on the Teaching of English, also known as the Dartmouth Writing Conference. Now, I just heard about it this year. Uh, this coming fall, we're going to do a 45, 45th year celebration of this conference. And then in five more years, we're going to do a 50th anniversary uh, celebration. But the legacy of this conference was profound. Two textbooks came out of this conference that shaped the teaching of the writing of the English language for more than two decades afterwards. What happened was that uh, they began to talk about self-expressive uses of language that would assist students in shaping their ideas through writing. Before, the teaching of English was mostly based on, was mostly focused on rules and syntax and grammar. Here, uh, they came up with a notion that the teaching of writing should be focused on helping the author find their authentic voice. This shaped the teaching of uh, English for decades afterwards, and we want to get back there. This is where we were, we want to get back there. We want to be the best institution in the country in terms of the teaching of writing. We're going to expand our first year uh, 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 classes in writing. And I want to understand how writing fits in to what has been called habits of mind. Mo it's mostly in the K-12 education world. But in the K-12 education world, rather than talking about skills or about depth in particular subject matters, they talk about habits of mind persistence, the ability to write and speak effectively, uh, uh, managing impulsivity, uh, being able to take lessons learned in one area and applying them to another. These are fundamental questions that are linked to what we now know about how the brain works. And so what we know is that the teaching of writing, what, what Christiane Donahue, our, who, who is our, uh, the head of the Writing and Rhetoric Center, calls um, uh, discursive flexibility. If you think about it, young people come into um, to Dartmouth today writing in so many different ways. Everything from, uh, from texting to tweeting to Facebook to MySpace to short essays. There are so many different ways in which they write, and they're all different. And when they come here, they're going to learn to write in many more different ways. The folks at Cornell have come to the conclusion that there are fundamentally different ways that you teach in the writing of physics or you teach the writing of, in comparative literature, or in any of the other fields. They identify 14 or 15 different ways that they can teach young people how to write effectively for a given field. We want to get there. Building on tradition, we're going to innovate and create, uh, we hope, the best writing program in the country. Now, you know, traditions are, are just, um, uh, uh, every time I go through another one, it, it, it gives me um, a sense of the, the profundity of the experience that young people have. Now, on the top left is Fred Harris. Um, he was from the Dartmouth class of 1911, and along with President Ernest Fox Nichols, launched the very first Dartmouth Winter Carnival. Now, 
um, this past year, on February 10th, I stood in front of the community and, uh, and launched exactly 100 years ago to the day, the 100th Winter Carnival. Now, you look on the right top, that's the very first snow sculpture ever built, 1929, right? On the bottom left is the ski jump, uh, which is now the 13th hole at Dartmouth Country Club. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a plaque up there that, that, that shows where the ski jump used to be. I am so glad we don't have the ski jump anymore uh, as a physician. Uh, <laughs> and if you, look in the, on the, if you look on the bottom left, you, that's from this year, from 2011. And this is supposed to be an exact replica of the, uh, of the uh, 1920. Now, you know, I, I love our students to death. But our snow sculpture building skills have deteriorated a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, tradition, in terms of the social life, is also a critical part of what makes uh, uh, the experience here so unique. This is, uh, this is KDE, 9 Webster Avenue, just across the street from where I live. Uh, it used to be Delta Upsilon back in the, in the days when there were no, no, no women here. And um, it's, uh, it's still a fact here that uh, Greek life is extremely popular. 68% of eligible students, uh, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, are part of the Greek system. Now, uh, we are working very hard to create all kinds of new uh, uh, social alternatives. Uh, the new class of 53 commons, formerly Thayer, is going to have three flat floor spaces that uh, uh, two of them are as large as the Collis Common Ground and another one that will be very significant. Uh, we're working very hard so that people who are not affiliated with the Greek system have fantastic social alternatives, but it's just a fact that Greek life is very, very important. And, you know, I, I, did, some, I, I, I did some studying on this, and so how, how is coming in as Dartmouth president how should I understand the Greek system? I know that everyone's not a part of it, but boy, a huge percentage of the students are voting with their feet and joining. One piece of data. Uh, of the students who choose to go to other schools and not come to Dartmouth, 20 to 30% say that the Greek system is a reason for them choosing not to come to Dartmouth. Of the students who come to Dartmouth, uh, only 1% say that they're coming here for the Greek system, and yet 68% join when they can. Okay? So something is different about the Greek system here. And here's what is different. As those of you from uh, uh, will, will remember, the parties are completely open to everyone. And in other campuses, the Greek system is the very definition of exclusivity. And, and, and so while they do choose who is in fraternity or sorority, it is an open system where everyone uh, can participate. There are nights when I wish it wasn't so open. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, that, that the, the lack of exclusivity uh, in terms of inviting people in, I think, is important. Also, you know, the evidence is pretty overwhelming these days. The evidence that finding a group of friends when you're 18 to 22, being very close to them, and then having those friends stay with you for the rest of your life, that's actually good for your mental health. It keeps you happier. I mean, now there's all this research on happiness, and having these friends that you keep for, for a long time is a critical piece of happiness. But it's also good for your cardiovascular health. <laughs> so um, those are the good parts of it. Tremendous amount of social service. Lots of, um, lots of, uh, of uh, uh, very close bonds that are formed. But then I've talked to faculty members. And there were a couple of votes on the floor of the faculty to close down the Greek system. And I said, well, what? are the problems. There are, there are a lot of problems, but two of the biggest ones that the faculty identify are binge drinking and sexual assault. So as a public health physician, what I said was, OK, if we know that students are voting with their feet, that they're getting something out of this, and you can point to data and evidence that suggests that having these kinds of friendships is good for you, then why don't we attack the real problem directly? So I began uh, two task forces, a, a student presidential um, uh, uh, committee, first on alcohol, and then secondly on binge drink, excuse me, on, um, on, uh, on sexual assault. So we began talking about it very, very openly. And some of you may have heard that we announced uh, this past spring a national learning collaborative on binge drinking, 
binge drinking. And it's, it was a very interesting process because um, uh, we studied all the uh, public health and social science literature on how we can do two things. One, we know young people will drink. And so what we have to do is reduce the harm. Make sure that, that we don't have, last year we had more than 100 hospitalizations from drinking. So we want to get our, the number of hospitalizations down to zero. But moreover, we want them to drink less. You know, uh, the students, when they say, uh, uh, when they're asked to, to uh, comment on what is moderate drinking, for the students, moderate drinking is five to 11 beers uh, in an evening. Right? Uh, now, uh, uh, s some of you may have gone back to those uh, uh, standards when you're back here this weekend. Uh, 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 but but here, here's the point. Here's the point. Um, I'm now uh, a co-chair of the National Institute for uh, Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. I'm the national co-chair of a college president's uh, group. And it turns out that ever since about 15 years ago when the first studies were done, 40% of all college students admit to binge drinking within the last two weeks, which by the definition that they've put forth, it's five drinks within two hours for men and four drinks within two hours for women. So 40%, 40% binge drinking on college campuses across the nation. We're probably a little bit above that, but state schools, University of Iowa's at 70%. And is it without harm? Absolutely not. 2,000 identifiable deaths just from drinking. How many more with uh, people falling off rooftops like we had happen just two weeks ago? Two students uh, fell off the roof of AD uh, and miraculously didn't die. But we almost had our first deaths from alcohol. Now, um, this is a huge problem. It's also linked to sexual assault. The majority, uh, if not, and it's hard to know what the real percentages here because it's just really difficult to get the data, but clearly the majority of sexual assaults happen under the influence of alcohol. Now, you know, alcohol is the perfect, the first and the perfect designer drug. We now know exactly how it works. It shuts off your prefrontal cortex, so all judgment goes out the window, and it excites your nucleus accumbens, which is that part of your brain which pushes you for immediate gratification. It does exactly what the students want it to do, right? <laughs> uh, so, so it's a hard thing to tackle. What, we, what we're doing and what we've announced, um, I had uh, the great experience of working with some of the most brilliant um, uh, leaders in um, uh, quality improvement in healthcare. Those of you from the business world will recognize names like uh, W. Edwards Deming, the Six Sigma program at General Electric. These continuous quality improvement approaches that are based on data. And um, I had the great good fortune of working with a number of people, Don Berwick, who's now head of Medicare Medicaid in, uh, down in Washington, uh, who brought those techniques to healthcare. I've worked on two of those projects, one in Peru and one in Rwanda. So we thought, why can't we get a bunch of schools together to work on a continuous quality improvement approach to lowering the, the harms of alcohol, hospitalizations, and decreasing the overall drinking level while we work together almost as if we were one big company trying to innovate and find ways of making the situation better. When we announced, 14 schools were brave enough to announce that they were gonna be part of the initiative. But the way we stated it was, everyone's got the problem, and you know what? Dartmouth's got a problem too. But we're gonna lead the nation in taking on this uh, problem so that we can uh, keep our students safe and lower the overall drinking age. Thank you. Now, we're, we're paying for most of this. Some of our really generous trustees are paying for it. But we were told by the quality improvement people that you should have a fee so that the schools have some skin in the game. And the fee is $20,000, which is really nothing for the budgets of most of these students. Small schools stu stood up and paid for it. And one very large school that I will not name with a very large endowment, much larger than ours. Uh, when I called the president, the president said, well, you know, we'd really like to do this, but we're, you know, we're in time, a time of tight budget constraints and we just don't know if we can afford the 20,000. So I said, you know what, we'll give you a scholarship. <laughs> we, we haven't heard back from them since. But here, here's the thing, a lot of college presidents didn't want to take this on 
because you have to stand up and say, we've got a problem, but we're going to tackle it. And, and so we've got 32 schools now, more than doubled since we announced it, 35 more on the wait list, uh, four out of the eight IVs are involved, and we think we're going to make a real difference here. Right? So you will hear it, right? And I, you know, I just, I, uh, we want Dartmouth to be known as a place where you go and you have a great time, but a place where they're so committed to your safety that um, you will feel comfortable sending your children here. That, that's, that's our target, that's our goal. This is the class, uh, this is the 1999-2000 uh, Women's Basketball Ivy League Championship team. Right. Now, um, you all know that um, uh, Dartmouth has had a tradition of excellence in, uh, in, in athletics in, in, uh, in many different areas. And we are building on that. So the very top picture is the Rugby Sevens National Champion. They, they are the national champions. Uh, it's, it's the second national champions we've had in some time. The ski team, of course, won the national championship in 2007. And on the bottom right uh, is the first ever in history women's Ivy League tennis champions uh, this past year. Some of you may have heard Harry. Um, I hope you did, because Harry's just, uh, he, 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 when we recruited him, he was arguably the most successful athletic director in the country at Williams. Um, but it, it, my approach to athletics is the same. I asked, a fund, I asked some fundamental questions. I love sports. I love athletics and I've been an athlete all my life. But I, I wanted to understand what science has taught us about the value of athletics. And it turns out that some of the best work in this area came right here in Dar from Dartmouth College. Dave Bucci in psychology and brain science has been looking at the impact of research on cognitive function. He found that, and this is in mice, but they've repeated this in, uh, in, 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 uh, in um, uh, humans. Uh, they found that exercise, especially in the adolescent, late adolescence period, increased hippocampal neurogenesis, which is the part of your brain that's responsible for long-term memory. He found that exercise helps you learn. And they've now repeated these studies in, uh, in, in human subjects, and the, and the effect seems to be clear, especially important in the 18 to 22-year-old group, but uh, very real throughout your life. I remember looking at studies years ago uh, out of the Hebrew Rehabilitation Hospital, a hospital I used to work in when I was in Boston, where they showed that weight training was effective in improving the activities of daily living for 80-year-olds. So for me, uh, athletics and participation in athletics is not just something we do as a side activity. It has to be something core to the experience at Dartmouth. And this is where I think traditional values at Dartmouth and scientific research once again come together beautifully. Every single student graduating from Dartmouth should have the unfair advantage of knowing the importance of physical exercise and engaging in it for the rest of their lives. We want them to remember what they learned here. And if we, if we do two things, if we reduce binge drinking and increase exercise, <laughs> yeah. good shape. But, you know, Harry says it just right. Harry says winning is not a, a, a goal, it's an outcome. And so we also know that the research on things like stretching, dynamic stretching versus static stretching, on, on nutrition, all this stuff has just exploded. And the very best athletes are doing things that we know now are helpful. I mean, Kobe Bryant and LeBron James both do yoga. And it's not because they're interested in Eastern philosophy. Right. <laughs> it works. It reduces injuries, increases flexibility, makes them better players, increases their focus, their, intellect, their, their ability to focus on a game. And so we've just initiated the uh, Dartmouth College Peak Performance Institute. What we want to tell athletes who are interested in Dartmouth College is that if you come here, we're bringing science to the table, and we're going to get you to 95% of your capacity. No other Ivy League school has a Peak Performance Institute. I bet you anything they're all going to copy us as soon as uh, we <laughs> announce ours. But that's the point. Look, we have 34 teams. 
if we have 34 teams, we're going to be excellent in every one. We're going to prepare, even if we can't recruit the best athletes, we're going to get them to their highest potential. And if that's the case, we're going to be winning a lot of Ivy League championships. <laughs> so um, this is actually not the class of 1976. Sorry. <laughs> It worked better when the class of 51 was here. They actually thought it was them when they were <laughs> <laughs> This is 1896 Dartmouth Medical School, the very first clinical use of the x-ray in the United States. Right? So we have a tradition of innovation in medicine as well. And so the area that we're probably best known for is outcomes research. Uh, Jack Wenberg, 30-some years ago, started asking really uh, simple, but for other doctors, really annoying questions. Why is there so much variation? Why does one son who, lives, who goes to school in this county in Vermont uh, go to a school where everyone's had their tonsils out? And why does the other son who goes to school in another county just uh, to the south in Vermont go to a school where nobody's had their tonsils out? Of course, we've known for years that taking tonsils out is not effective. But there happened to be a guy in the other town who was very good at taking tonsils out and made a lot of money from it. Jack infuriated the medical community. Uh, people were, wanted to kill him. How dare you suggest that we do things for patients on the basis of anything other than concern for the patient? But over 35 years, he's discovered huge variations in cost and quality in healthcare. And usually, the higher cost healthcare regions were also not the highest quality healthcare regions. And so we've asked this question, and you may have heard during the healthcare debate something called the Dartmouth Atlas. The Dartmouth Atlas is what we publish here that tells you, that, that has the best information uh, base in the country, and, and arguably in the world, about the relationship between cost and quality in healthcare. So knowing that uh, we are in, in such a great position to really begin thinking about healthcare delivery what actually happens as we take the fruits of science and clinical research and actually try to deliver them to patients, since we knew so much about that, we started the first ever Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. Since then, about seven other schools have started their own healthcare delivery science institutes, and even though they'll never admit it, they copied us. Right? <laughs> now, why are we, we, we're light years ahead of all of them, though, because we have this foundation of great outcomes research. Uh, and here, here's how it's going to work. You, those of you not in the medical field may not know this, but there's not a single medical school in the world, except now for Dartmouth Medical School, that teaches the delivery of health care to, uh, to, to its students. We teach health policy, but that's different from delivery. I would argue that the modern American hospital is the most complicated social institution we've ever invented. Sick people, nuclear medicine, medicines of all kinds. We wipe out people's immune systems and uh, put them in negative airflow isolation chambers. We have um, uh, lots of money flowing in and out, huge amounts of technology, and some of the most bizarre, archaic, complicated social structures you've ever, ever seen. Doctors can't, do, can't talk to nurses. Nurses can't talk to doctors. What is going on? And we have assumed, since the beginning of medicine, that if you get to the basic science, understand the molecular genetics of disease, and you have new treatments, then the rest just takes care of itself. As opposed to saying the complexity of delivery is precisely the thing that academic institutions should focus on. Because you need systems engineers. Systems engineers have had unbelievable impacts on things like waiting times in emergency rooms when they've been able to apply their, their, their skills to that problem, which they haven't very often as anyone who's waited in an emergency room will know. Right? Uh, people in the fields of management, operations, strategy, at the business school have a tremendous amount to teach those of us in medicine. Sociology and anthropology. Anthropology is my field. My goodness, talk about uh, uh, primitive tribes. Right? <laughs> this is the, the, the way communication happens and, hi and, and hierarchies of power clash in hospitals is something we need to study. So for the first time in history, We've taken all those groups, business, um, uh, uh, engineering, medical school, and arts and sciences, brought them together into this group that really is going to redefine how we think about the task of health 
not just medical, medical care. The first group of uh, uh, students in our new master's program in healthcare delivery science, also the first one uh, ever uh, put together in the world, are coming in in about three weeks, and it's an amazing group. 50 people with an average number of years of experience in healthcare of 25 years. So keep listening. We think we're, we're, we think we're ahead of the game on this one. You know, healthcare costs are going from two and a half trillion to four and a half trillion in the next eight or nine years. It is the thing which is going to break the bank of the U.S. government. We think we're going to be at the forefront of bringing the resources of a great institution like Dartmouth to bear on tackling what is arguably the most difficult, complicated, and important social problem that we face today. Uh -oh. So um, one of the things that I've really admired um, <clears throat> and heard a lot about from uh, students who benefited um, is the Great Issues course. And the Great Issues course, one of the, um, uh, I talked to a lot of the um, older alums who, uh, who, who were part of it. What they told me about the Great Issues course, and some of you will know, this, is, this was John Sloan Dickey's effort to bring the troubles of the world to campus. And they tell me basically three things. One, <clears throat> it was great to have a class with everyone sitting together talking about the most important issues of the day. Two, it was great to have speakers uh, coming from the outside world. <coughs> um, uh, 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 three was that uh, it taught them about bias in the media. And four, it was a great writing experience. I guess it's four, not three that I, I, I talked about, sorry. And so we look at that. I don't think students really need lessons in bias in the media. I, I, you know, I, I think that that's pretty well known. And in fact, we get great speakers here all the time. But those two pieces, having a discussion with your entire class, and two, <clears throat> having that intensive writing experience later in your a Dartmouth career, I think those two are incredibly important. But I, and, and I also think it's that we can focus our efforts and get even greater speakers. So uh, we're bringing in lots of speakers over the summer, and we're moving toward the possibility of relaunching the Great Issues course. Now, this is a decision that the faculty makes, but we've, um, uh, we've raised the, the question of whether there can be a Great Issues course during the sophomore summer, the one time after uh, 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 freshman year where everyone is on campus. And so we're hoping <clears throat> that it will be, one, an opportunity for the sophomores to hear great speakers. We, you know, we have great ones coming in. Joel Klein from the New York School System, Robert Reich, the class of 68 is coming back, and, and uh, um, uh, Hank Paulson, Jeff Immel. Uh, we've, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're hoping <clears throat> that a lot of others will, will, that a few others will join us as well. And so they're going to hear these great speakers. And right now the class is a small one, only 60 people. But we hope that uh, the faculty will decide that this is something we can do for the entire class. And that's going to happen uh, this summer. So once again, you know, uh, building on a tradition and seeing if we can do something innovative. So in, in, in my last few slides, I just want to talk about uh, what I think true innovation means. So this is William Kumquamba, <clears throat> born in rural Malawi. Uh, and he became something of a media star. Uh, but this is his story. He dropped out of school during the 2002 Malawi famine. It was the worst in 50 years. And he had to drop out because he couldn't afford the $80 a year tuition for school. He was determined to get an education. He read science books. And when he was 14, with rough plans from a book called Using Energy that someone had left for him, he got a bunch of scrap materials, and he built a windmill. His family and neighbors thought he was completely crazy, but the electricity generated lit four light bulbs and two radios. So what does that mean? I mean, I've been to rural Malawi. What does that mean? It means you can study and read at night, and it means you're connected to the outside world. The TED, technology, uh, entrepreneurship, and design, I think, the very famous sort of meetings that they have all over the world, they, f they found him somehow. I don't know how they found him. They heard about his technology, and they wrote a book. Uh, they helped him to write his book, his memoir, called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, which became a New York Times bestseller. I was privileged to meet him uh, about a year and a half ago, and guess where he is today? This is the kind of innovation that we want here at Dartmouth College. And you know what? William was so excited to come to Dartmouth College. 
and mostly because he heard that Thayer en Engineering School had a program where, free of charge, you could rent out any power tool you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so William is so special, and he's so special uh, because what I think is my purpose for being here. This is the great John Sloan Dickey's from his very first convocation speech in 1946. And he said, I want you to remember two things. First, that the world's troubles are your troubles. <clears throat> but second, I want you to know that the world's worst troubles come from within men. And there's nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. I read this when I was <clears throat> interviewing for the job here. And, and when I read this, um, I just couldn't believe it. I went and called Ed Haldeman and Al Mulley, the two people who were running uh, the search, and I said, are you kidding me? Is that what you want me to do? I, 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 I don't know how to be president of Dartmouth College, but I think I know how to do that. <laughs> That's what we're doing. You know, um, there are many people who say, well, but does that mean that we have to go into practical disciplines? Not at all. Uh, becoming a professor in comparative literature uh, is tackling the world's troubles just as much as becoming an engineer, in my view. So how do we do this? How do we continue to maintain the great spirit of this place? How every year <clears throat> when we face, this was the class of 1986 commencement, when, when I look out at the class and think about what we're doing, how do we continue to uh, uh, force ourselves to innovate? One of the things that I've, a goal that I've set for myself and my team is that we have, to be fun, we have to be responsible at Dartmouth for one fundamental innovation in higher education every year. That's the target. So in the first year, <clears throat> healthcare delivery science um, uh, was recognized as a fundamental innovation. This year, <clears throat> it's our binge drinking collaborative. Believe it or not, that's never been done before, bringing quality improvement techniques to tackling a problem like binge drinking. What will it be next year? I don't know, and I'm worried already. <laughs> but that is what I think I have to do to live up to the legacy of this great place. You know, uh, um, as I was coming here, um, I uh, learned that Jack Beatty, some of you may, may have heard him on the uh, uh, radio show NPR On Point, the gravelly-voiced guy who was former editor of The Atlantic, <clears throat> Um, I wrote to him and asked him to come and have lunch because he lives in the area. And he sent me this note. Let me read it to you. <clears throat> Jack wrote, I taught a senior writing class here last fall. I stress senior because all the students had had four years of Dartmouth socialization. The class was built around collective critiques of student short stories. The students all wrote well, a few wonderfully. But what impressed me more than their talent was their decency. I feared hurt feelings, bruised egos, too critical tr critiques. Instead, they managed the social miracle of being at once honest and empathic in their comments. They cushioned criticism and respect, even affection. I told them how humanly rare that kind of communication was. I checked my experience against that of a friend who teaches political science here. In over 40 years of teaching in a half dozen universities, both here and abroad, he told me, he had never had students who treated each other so well. That speaks volumes of good about the Dartmouth experience. You know, in the slide I showed you where Ernest Martin Hopkins is handing the Wentworth Bowl over to, to uh, <clears throat> President Dickey, um, uh, Ernest uh, Martin Hopkins uh, had some final remarks. And here's what he said. <clears throat> A friendly observer of the college once said to me that nobody could understand Dartmouth who didn't recognize that it was not simply another educational institution, but that it was likewise a religion. Personally, I believe very strongly that it is a family. And through two or three decades of administrative leadership in the college, in association with friends and colleagues like yourselves, and in association with thousands of alumni, yes, and even into the families of the alumni and undergraduates, I have become impressed more and more with the sweetness that attached to the relationship between one and another, which constituted this great family, which we call Dartmouth. Over this weekend, please drink in once again the sweetness of Dartmouth, and welcome back. <clears throat> Thank you.